have your way this morning. Yeah. Lord, I want to thank you already that <laughs> so much of what's been shared this morning, from the from the songs to the to the verses, just to people talking about their lives, Lord, it's just reflecting what you put on my heart to bring, and I thank you for that. Mm. Lord, I ask that you would speak what you want to speak this morning, Lord that you would use me to get your message across. Lord, I thank you that you are a big God, you are a good, good Father, that you love us more deeply than we could ever know. Yeah. And Lord, I ask that this morning as we look at your word, that Lord, you will reveal a bit more of your heart for us. Yeah. Lord, that we would see how much you love us and how much you desire for us in your presence. And Lord, that you would also stir us to grow in our faith, to deepen in our walk with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. This is going to be a little bit different for something that I do. I mean, you know, still going to have the Bible in it. They're not going to get rid of that, but it's going to be a little different. So as I begin today, I want to acknowledge that God is speaking to a number of people on the same sort of themes that I'm going to talk about. You will have heard some messages and devotionals recently, and will hear more in the weeks to come that will bring out some of these same truths. And the fact is, it's God who's bringing this theme through. It's not the result of a decision made by anyone to focus on a topic. We don't go around telling people what they need to preach on. God is stirring people, and he's stirring them on the same themes. And if he is stirring so many people to speak on the same sorts of topics, then let us listen and respond. And the theme that I see coming through is about the outworking of our faith. Today's sermon is called David's Esther's and Rupert's. <laughs> and the first thing I want to acknowledge is it has been a while since I've been up here speaking. Um, and in that time, one or two things have happened in the life of my family. For a start, Elise and I are now part of a family rather than just a couple. So little Ezekiel Theodore Nichols was born on the 12th of September, weighing 4.03 kgs, which is 8 pound 14. And we love him incredibly, and he's upstairs with mum at present, so that's great. We also now understand what it means to have no sleep. We thought we knew, but we didn't. <laughs> You uh, yeah. <laughs> uh. And another thing that happened in the time was that I was released from work, both here and at uh, my teaching role. So four weeks off from school and a month and a bit from preaching. And this has been good. When you live a busy life, it can be easy to get into a routine, not always put in the amount of time in the closet with God that you need. Ezekiel has been helping break my routine. <laughs> But God was already beginning to do that even before he arrived. In fact, God sidelined me for longer than I was expecting. I ended up getting sick the weekend I was supposed to bring my last message before going on leave. And then I got COVID two weeks ago when I was meant to bring my first message back, which does make me begin to question, well, why? But then a Christian work colleague reminded me that God sidelines people for a season so that they can rest and refresh, which is good. And so that other members of the team can play on the field. I'm so stoked that Elise and I have been able to take this time off, and thank you to each one of you who have made this possible. Now, I really enjoyed Psalm Timber. We made sure we listened to all the sermons online. It was great to hear so many different voices. It was a season where we could be reminded that God doesn't just speak through the chosen few. There are no chosen few in that way. But it really is the first verse that was mentioned this morning, the priesthood of all believers. We each have different roles and giftings, and there are leadership roles mentioned in the New Testament. But in the end, we are all serving under one head, Jesus. Yeah. And we can all be used by him however he wants to use us, including bringing a message or gleaning a truth from Scripture. So I thank each one of you who agreed to speak and I always want us to be a church where there's multiple voices heard. Because the more of us that step out, the more that God will be able to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. To use a quote that I think Mark used to reference, Smith Wigglesworth said, It does not take a cultured or an educated man to fill a position in God's church. What God requires is a yielded, consecrated, holy life. And he can make it a flame of fire. 
as Psalm 81.10b says, open your mouth and I will fill it. Each one of us has been called by God from the eldest down to little Ezekiel. God, therefore, has the right to use each one of us however he wishes. We need to be ready to be used by him no matter what he asks, to open our mouth so that he can fill it. My mum has a story one time. She was at a, a prophetic thing and they were practicing giving words for people. And so she felt she was sitting there looking at this person and saying, okay, God, what are you having? And God gave her literally one word. And it made no sense to her. So she was sitting there going, well, do I bring this? What do I do? And eventually she spoke that one word. And when she spoke that word, God gave her another. And when she spoke that, God gave her another. Open your mouth so I can fill it. You don't need to know exactly where God is taking you, as long as you know the next word that he wants you to bring. I remember hearing about a preacher who was standing in front of his congregation having an argument with God. No, I'm not going to do that. No, no, I'll be ridiculous. God, God, I'll look silly. It's, it's, it, no, I'm not going to. Okay, fine. And he got down on his hands and his knees and he barked like a dog. And immediately, someone rushed up from the back of the, of the auditorium and said, what do I need to do to be saved? And that person was an unbelieving man who had a believing wife who had been praying for him for years and dragging him along to church. And just that previous week, she had said to him, you need to get your life right with God. You need to do it. And he said, I'll get my life right with God when the pastor gets down on his hands and knees and barks like a dog. <laughs> when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he danced before it in a linen ephod, and he looked so ridiculous that his wife Michael criticized him for his behavior, saying he'd made a fool of himself in public. David's reply was that he was dancing before the Lord, not before anyone else. And in 2 Samuel 6, 22, he stated, I will become even more undignified than this. Verse 23 then adds, And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. Do we want spiritual children? Yes. We cannot try to hang on to our dignity. Because we are Davids in the world. We are called by God to reveal his glory. To magnify his name, even at the cost of our own dignity. Let me be clear, I'm aiming this at myself when I say, when is the last time you allowed your faith and trust in God to come through in an awkward scenario? When it would have been easier to remain silent? When is the last time you were a witness to God in the world when it could cost you something? I was reminded last week that the Greek word for witness is materium, which begins with the word martyr. We are called to be witnesses in all the world, and we are called to be witnesses to God unto death. I struggle to witness to God even unto mild discomfort. We are Davids in the world because we are called to make much of God. And we can do this even if we're not living pious, sanctified lives of sinless perfection. David stumbled pretty terribly at times, but he was able to use those flaws to point to a greater God who covered over them. Read Psalm 51, written after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband to cover it up. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Verse 4, against you, only you, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Verses 10 to 12, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Yeah. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The brokenness and honesty of David 
highlights the majesty, the authority, the justice of God, and the mercy and the love of God. He makes much of God by being undignified before him and before the people around him. He doesn't pretend to be perfect, quite the opposite. And in being open and vulnerable, he shows just how much he trusts his almighty loving Father. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, God says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There's a reason that Jesus is so hard on the Pharisees. They claim to be perfect in their own eyes. And as a result, they minimize the work of God. It's all about them. Being real is harder. Acknowledging our flaws and failings before God and before others is humbling and vulnerable. But the transforming work of Christ is so much more apparent to others if we're willing to show it at work in us too. We are Davids in this world, laying down our dignity for the glory of Christ. And we are Esthers in this world. Esther is the only book in the Bible where the name of God is not once mentioned. And yet God is at work throughout it, through Esther. Which shows that you don't even have to hear God's audible voice to be in God's will. The most famous verse in Esther is chapter 4 verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place that you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. We are in a world that does not acknowledge God, where God's name is never spoken. As Bob shared in his devotional this week, we're also in a world where the birth pangs of the end are apparent, where we are approaching the return of our king. And who knows? but that we have been adopted into the royal family of God and placed into the world right where we are for such a time as this. God will do what he wants to do. He will achieve his purposes. But if we remain silent, then our families and friends may perish. C.S. Lewis said, For you will certainly carry out God's purposes however you act, but it makes a difference to you whether you serve like Judas or like John. Esther literally risked her life to do the task she had been given. In approaching the king of Persia without an invitation, she could have been put to death. But if we risk our lives and lose them, we will still gain an eternal reward. And if we don't, we risk the eternal lives of those around us. It is not enough to live out a silent faith. It might be enough for us personally. But is it enough for us personally if we personally are the only ones who are saved? Are we willing to be undignified in the world for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of salvation, for the sake of the kingdom? Because here's the bitter truth, the lost will not respond if no one tells them they need to. Romans 10 verse 14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Now in this verse, preaching is the Greek word charizo. To preach, proclaim, tell. Often urging acceptance of the message with warnings of the consequences for not doing so. So what I want to point out from that is it's not about just bringing someone to hear a sermon on Sunday. It's about anything that is sharing the truth with them in love. Pointing out how it's changed you. Letting them know what they're being saved from and what they're being saved to. It's about witnessing with love and truth combined. Being as shrewd as snakes and as innocent or gentle as doves. Matthew 10 verse 16. I think that's a very important verse for us to remember whenever we are out in the world letting our faith be seen. So often Christians have been as gentle as bricks and as shrewd as bricks. So what is this? It's about, 
It's about doing life together. It's actually caring for one another, as we've heard a little bit about this morning. Thank you to those of you who have shown your love for Elise and I in practical ways in this last season. As simple as a text to say you're thinking of us, or a meal dropped off, or an understanding question. It's about relationship. And in terms of faith, it's about introducing others to the one who was introduced to you. When I look around this room at all the people here, I don't know everyone's backstory. I don't know how you all came to the faith, or even how you came to this church. But in terms of people that have joined in the last few years, I do know how you came here. Because we've had people who came to the store, looked in, and then moved on. And we've had that happen over the last few years. But those who have come and have stuck and have joined and have become part of this family, without exception, have been invited by someone who was already here. Without exception. Now, a verse that we in this church take heart of and absolutely hold to is Acts 2.47, the Lord added to their number daily. And it's up to God to add to us. We don't look around and say, we must be bigger. It's up to God to do that. But we are the hands and the feet and the mouth of God. So in general, people no longer come to church without being invited by someone. And most non-Christians won't even consider walking in the door. They need to be spoken to. They need Esthers in their lives who will open their mouth and risk whatever may come and risk looking foolish and undignified. Wait, you believe in God? Really? Because the kingdom must keep advancing and it's not the passive who advance the kingdom of God. And, but why would we do that? What do we have to offer? Are we inviting them just to come to a service for an hour and a half every Sunday and that's it? No. If that's all there is to the faith, then we'll never see anyone come to it. But that's not all there is to the faith. Our faith is life-changing. It's the only solution to the problems we see in the world. It's bigger than politics. It's bigger than culture. It's bigger than a Rugby World Cup final. It can set the sinner free and break the yoke of oppression. It's not just sit and listen to someone talk for 30 minutes, have some tea and coffee and go home. If that's all there is to your faith, then what's your faith? It's got to be everything. It's got to be everything. How we do the service is not as important as how we live. If your faith is not influencing how you do business, then it's not yet an all-encompassing faith. If your faith is not influencing your home life, how you raise your children or talk to your spouse, then it's not yet an all-encompassing faith. If your faith is not yet influencing the entertainment options you feed on, or the way you interact with others, those in the faith and outside the faith, then it's not yet an all-encompassing faith. But it can be. And it's not about enforcing those things. It's not about me saying here, you know, these are the things that you should be seeing, and you feeling judged and going, oh no, I need to do better, and Carl's telling me off. That's not what it's supposed to be. You can't enforce this stuff from the outside, bound to you legalistically. We're not trying to offer a legalism, because we already know we can't live up to God's standard. Neither are we offering a concept or a religious formula. We need more than that. We need Jesus. We need the person of Christ. E. Stanley Jones said, I can accept the multiplication table as true, but I cannot say my prayers to it. A weeping child cannot be satisfied if you offer him the principle of motherhood. He wants a mother. I'm not a walking robot asking only for a path. I'm a person asking for a person. Is the way a principle or a person? It's both. As we seek the face and the heart of God personally, each one of us, God's Spirit should begin to transform us from within as God wins you to himself through his goodness, his kindness, his faithfulness, through who he is, through getting to know him. That's the thing that will impact on our witness, not enforcing it from the outside. We radiate it. We show it. We are healed by it. 
by the person of Christ. And we're also <laughs> Ruperts in this world. And there are other Ruperts in this world too. About a month after Elise and I moved into, uh, were married, we moved into our current home. And about a month after that, a cat started turning up to visit us. We have a big glass sliding door on our lounge and this cat would turn up and sit outside the door and look in a, at us sitting in the lounge. And he would sit there and he would occasionally meow at us. And he would sit there for hours. Now we saw he was a well-fed cat, so we knew he had owners somewhere, uh, but he was turning up most days and staying most of the day. So eventually we started going out and sitting with him. And we'd take our bean bags near where he would turn up and he would come and he'd be all smoochy and I think I have some pictures of that up on the screen now. Okay, so there's, there's the cat. Now after a while, we, he, because he was so persistent, we started letting him into the lounge as well. But that was it, no, no further, we didn't feed him, we knew he had owners, we'd just enjoy the fact that he was there. And we called him Rupert because we had no idea what his name was and he seemed like a Rupert. Now anyway, after about eight or nine months of Rupert turning up every day, a lost cat poster was left in our letterbox. And aside from the name, which we didn't think suited him as much as Rupert, it was obviously our cat. Now he'd been missing from home for over a month, during which time he had been at ours every day, still not being fed. And so of course we did the only thing we could do. With tears in our eyes, feeling very conflicted about it, we rang the number on the poster, and Rupert's real owners came and took him home, and we thought we'd never see him again. Three days later, he returned. <laughs> so they came and collected him again. And he returned. And after a few times of this, the owners said to us, it's obvious he's decided he's got a new family now, um, so he's yours. We'll just count, him, count ourselves lucky if he comes to visit us occasionally. Uh, by the way, they live literally across the road from us, and he just hadn't bothered crossing the road. And that's how Rupert joined our family. Now you're probably asking yourself one of two questions. Either, why are you telling us this, Carl? Or possibly, why did Rupert come and live with you when you weren't even feeding him? Now see, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> the thing you should know about Rupert is that the house he came from had five kids. And those five kids were only there every second week. And Rupert, we soon learned, has a fear of children and of loud noises and of change. And if any of those things ever happened in our house, he would leave. He'd just go out the door. So we realized <laughs> Elise and I were stable, childless, and only occasionally bursting into song, at which point Rupert would leave the house. So living with us felt safe to Rupert. And we can tell that because over time, Rupert has become more and more relaxed in how he sleeps, both in and around our house. And I have some pictures of that as well. There's a content cat. And the first reason I'm telling you about Rupert is this. If you feel safe, you can relax. You can let your guard down. If you know you feel safe in a certain location or with a certain person, you will keep going there and visiting them. And when you feel safe in this church fellowship, you'll let your guard down with God. I know, because I did it when I arrived. I'd been through a terrible season of life, and I was a broken mess. But in the presence of God, and among supportive brothers and sisters in Christ, I found healing. I was able to regularly pour my heart out to God on the altar, to literally cry in the middle of worship, to lay on my face in the presence of God and just let him heal me. And I'm so thankful to this church fellowship for being such a safe and welcoming place for that to happen. And that is what we should be, the broken and hurting people of the world. Never compromising God's standards or downplaying his truth, but not bashing them with a brick of truth either. We will always endeavor to preach the whole word of God here, but we will aim to do so in love. Andrew's currently in the middle of a series, What God Hates, 
And yet, through it, I hope you are seeing how much God loves us. We need to speak the truth in love and give space for the broken to find the soft, dove-like grace of God and healing under the shadow of his wings. To let God continue to transform them as he continues to transform us. If you feel safe, then like Rupert, you can relax. And as we invite people to Christ, they can learn to relax in his presence as well. Whether they're here on a Sunday or not. Now, if you've been paying close attention this morning, you will also be aware that Elise and I are no longer a childless couple. With the introduction of Ezekiel to our house, we have undermined everything that made Rupert feel safe. We now have a small child who is sometimes a very loud child, and every day is different. Change is the only constant. The stability that brought Rupert to us has been done away with. And honestly, I was really nervous when we were bringing Ezekiel home because I wondered if we were going to lose our cat. But here's the incredible thing. Rupert has accepted Ezekiel. And my final set of Rupert photos shows this. Now, sometimes it might be more of a tolerate than a love, but when we first brought Ezekiel home, Rupert got all drooly, and he has amazed us by embracing the fact that Ezekiel is part of this family now. He even hangs around when Ezekiel is crying, if it's only a low-level cry that gets too high, will he? But he would never have done that in the past. And what that has helped me to understand is that when we feel safe, we are willing to be stretched. We are willing to go outside of our comfort zones, perhaps even to face fears that we've not faced before. And that's what God wants to do for each one of us. We don't come into the family of God fully functional and emotionally mature. We come into the family of God broken, fearful, jumpy, with past hurts by people. But when we find ourselves accepted and loved as we are, we are able to face the challenges that come our way with greater confidence than in the past. What I've seen in the time we've been a part of Christ first is people relaxing into what God is stretching them to do. I've seen people with a fear of public speaking get up and speak a word of encouragement or a prayer or lead communion or even do a sermon. I've seen people who are not sure whether God would use them take the risk and tell someone what they think God is saying. I've seen someone like Ray come to the point where he's decided to get baptised. Hallelujah. And that's without anyone doing an altar call of baptism that I'm aware of. God works in our midst when we support one another in our journey of faith. When we help to provide a platform of worship and fellowship, of experiencing God's presence together. When we invite others to worship with us. Because that's the challenge that God's stirring me about at present. I look to the back wall of this auditorium and I see the words Christ, his community, and his cause. His community, aka the fellowship. His cause, aka bringing others to know him. And I think we're good, of course, still growing in the first two. But I also think we have a lot of room for growth in the third area. Yeah. It's something I'm praying into, and I hope you will as well. But I don't believe the answer is going to be providing a regular event or a program. I think it's going to be much more about each one of us being Davids and Esthers in our spheres of influence, our schools, our workplaces, our social lives, speaking our truth in love and witnessing both with our words and with the testimony of changed and changing lives as we grow in the presence of God. And as we do that, we need to keep our eyes open for the Ruperts, those who are maybe a bit hurting or broken, who just need a safe space to heal and grow, those who might even already be hanging around showing some interest. And we need to invite them to come and experience God for themselves, to taste and see that the Lord is good. That will sometimes look like inviting them to Christ first, or to your life group. Because if you feel safe in those places, why would you not want to invite someone to join you? But it also might look like just opening that sliding door, inviting them into your lounge, or going out with a beanbag to sit with them. It might or not always be a structured outreach. But let yourselves be led by the Spirit and not held back by fear. 
And note as well that we don't stop looking after Ruperts once they join our family. Each one of us should still be supporting one another, looking out for each other as a family. Our Rupert needs constant reminding that we still love him, even though there's another human that we're tending to. But it's not a drag, because we do love Rupert. We just need to be aware to make time to remind him of that. If you're a child of God, and you are, then you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Trust him to guide you, to prompt you, to speak through you, and listen for those promptings. But don't tie yourself up in knots about it either. We can't win anyone to Christ. We can only live in the Spirit and let him guide us. None of today's message is supposed to be seen as a you must do better, but there is a challenge nonetheless. Each one of us should be growing in our walk with God. And the way we are to do that is by continually spending time in his presence, corporately and individually. Are we creating that space on a regular basis, putting aside the distractions of the world and investing into worship, the word, and prayer? God is worthy of our everything. How much of our everything are we giving to him? Let's be David's and Esther's in this world. Let's dwell in the house of the Lord, in his presence, and let ourselves be transformed by his wonder-working power. Let's not be afraid to step out for him, even when we don't, like Esther, hear his name, uh, hear his voice or see his name acknowledged. Let's allow ourselves to be undignified for the sake of the gospel. And let's invest into the rupits that God brings our way, both those in the faith and those still meowing outside the door. We are stronger together. Never downplay what value you have in the life of another when you come in and with the Spirit of God. Now, if you want prayer in any of these areas today for a greater intimacy with God, for a greater confidence in God, for a greater witness for God, or for anything else, please come forward after this and, re and receive that prayer. Don't let this just be another morning meeting. Respond to whatever God would have you do. And Lord, I ask that you would minister in the way you want to. Lord, I do feel stirred about what my witness is like out in the world. But Lord, I know that you would have each one of us do our part. Lord, I thank you that it isn't supposed to be a burden. I thank you that it's not supposed to be a legalism. We're not called to necessarily stand on the street corner and just preach at people. But Lord, we are called to witness with our lives, to share what has happened to us for those around us. Lord, open our eyes to see the Ruperts, open our eyes to see those people who are hurting and broken in our world and who need you. Yeah. Open our eyes and open our mouths, Lord. Help us to speak what you would have us speak, to do so as shrewd as snakes and as gentle as doves. Lord, to bring your truth, to bring it in love, to see this world transformed for you. And Lord, give us wisdom to see the people that we should invite either to a service, to a home group, or just around for dinner, so that we can witness to them with our lives, with the presence of God.